Please turn your Bibles this morning to the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. This is on page 939 if you're using the Pew Bibles this morning. And the Apostle Paul, as the Holy Spirit leads and directs him, he, he writes this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. Let's bow forward to prayer. Father, we've just read your word through your servant Paul to the Romans almost 2,000 years ago. We're thankful that your word is true. We're thankful that you've given us revelation of such things as this. We're thankful that no matter what is going on in our society today, uh, you are still on your throne, and you are still good, and you are still holy. We ask this morning as we turn to your word that you'd help us to understand it and use it accurately in uh, thinking through the times in which we live. Lord, uh, your word here speaks of your wrath and it's being revealed, not something yet to come, but something that is being revealed. We are thankful that because of your gospel, because of your son, Jesus Christ, that we can be rescued from that wrath to be saved. That we can be counted righteous before you, a holy God, because of the righteousness of Christ credited to us by faith. So, Father, as we go through this passage and think through these things and think about the state of the uh, nation and world that we live in today, help us to take heart in the gospel. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is almost, when you read through the whole passage as I just did, it's almost a breathtaking passage. And as we read through a passage like that, we, at least I do, I I wonder, and maybe you should as well, well, how do we understand it? Uh, Does this speak of a process that every individual goes through? Does it speak of something true of everyone who has not yet been saved until they get saved? This is, this is their lot. This is something that they, everyone has experienced. Or is this something different? To be clear, Romans 1.18 says, look down there in your Bibles again, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteous, unrighteousness of men. Not, not just a select few items that we might describe as, as really bad sin or really bad unrighteousness. He says his wrath is revealed against all ungodliness and right, unrighteousness of men. 
Uh, as Paul goes on in chapters 2 and 3 of Romans, really what he's trying to do is drive home the point that he makes in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's everybody. We all have unrighteousness in us. We all have sin in us. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We all need to hear the gospel. We all need to be saved. So, yes, that's what we want to start with. That's the the heading verse, Romans 1 verse 18, kind of heads off this whole section that goes through uh, Romans chapter 3. But I take it, as Paul writes this, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. What he's getting at in this passage is there is a sense where, uh, yes, there is a wrath yet to come at the end of time, and we all want to be rescued from that. And yes, we've seen in the Old Testament, we, we see God's wrath against, for instance, Israel when they got into idolatry and they would experience uh, plagues and locusts and then other nations invading them. And so there's wrath at the end of time. There's wrath that happens in time, in certain circumstances, for a certain time, not, not all time. What this passage, I take it, is teaching us is if there's ever a question, is there really such a thing as the wrath of God yet to come? that you can look out upon history at different times and different places and see this pattern here in Romans chapter 1 that we're going to look at this morning, rejecting God as the creator, and then God turning them over to sin. That is the wrath of God being revealed right now, in time. And it's not always for all people at all time, but when you see the kind of things that we see here in Romans chapter 1, at certain times and in certain places in history, and for certain times, we see wrath happening right now. And it's in the way that Romans chapter 1 is written. And the reason I take it it's written like this is to point us to the fact that because you can see this happening in history, we've seen it, you can look around the world and, and, and see it, that you can also say, okay, if this is God's wrath being revealed right now, then also there will for sure be this end of time wrath that I certainly want to be rescued from and delivered from. So starting in verse 24 in Romans 1, we see in what way the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness. Today we'll look more to the what this looks like in the world uh, in Paul's day and before and after in history and also right now. Last week we saw that before getting to the what, what does this revelation of God's wrath look like? Paul brought out the why. In other words, why, why is it legitimate for God to have his wrath upon people in this world even now? Uh, Why the wrath of God upon all unrighteousness and ungodliness is is fair and right and just. We saw this last week. We saw two reasons last week why all people are without excuse. First, because they suppress the truth of God. Romans chapter 1 verse 18. Look down there in your Bibles. Uh, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. There's not an ignorance. There is a suppressing of the truth. It's not a matter of people just don't know any better, but that they did know about God and a basic sense of who he is and suppressed that knowledge and rejected him to go their own way. And what we saw last week was Paul considering possible objections to this truth and answering them. What he brought out in verses 19 and 20 of Romans chapter 1 is that there's a sense that in the creation itself, in looking to the heavens, in looking at mankind, uh, people created in God's image, there's a sense that all mankind everywhere knows God. 
in the sense that they realize there's a creator who is eternal and all-powerful, and therefore there's no excuse. There's no excuse, secondly, because knowing all this, they failed to glorify and thank him as God. That's all we saw last Sunday morning. But getting back to my question of this passage as a whole, and maybe I've already kind of answered it or answered enough where you know the answer to this question. How do we understand Romans 1, 18 and following, basically to the end of the chapter? Does it speak of a process that each one of us as individuals go through before we're saved? Does it speak of something that's true of everyone who's not yet saved? Or is it something different? Well, to answer that question, first let me ask this. Did each of you, before you were saved, experience what is said in verses 26 and 27? Uh, I, I won't read that right now. You can look down in your Bibles. Maybe. We all had our sin. We all rebelled against God, all in our certain ways. And because of that, before he saved us, we were all guilty. And we couldn't stand before the just, just judge of the universe and knowing that, that at the end of time, there would be that standing before God. So we all needed to be saved. We all need to be regarded as righteous by God, to have his righteousness credited or regarded as mine. And we get that by receiving Jesus as he's presented in the gospel. But when I ask that question, why I ask it, I, I don't think each of us in our unsaved, in our unsaved state had the, the particular sins that are described there. Uh, I take it just in thinking about what is said and then thinking about our own lives before God saved us, that we can see this isn't just about every individual in the whole world before God saves them. Well, then, what do we see here in Romans chapter 1? I take it it's not looking at individuals apart from Christ. Everyone's like this. Everyone's done all this. Anything described here? Yes, that's, that's happening. I take it it's a basic paradigm for what happens to cultures and societies who openly turn from God as the creator he has revealed himself to be. As we saw last week, this is apart from any special revelation. This is apart from having the Bible. In God's general revelation, he has revealed himself in his creation in such a way that all humanity can basically see his eternal power and his divine nature as they look upon the universe, the heavens, and mankind as God's image bearer. That's not revelation that can save anyone. That, that wouldn't save anybody. We can only be saved through hearing and receiving Jesus Christ as he's revealed in the gospel. But the natural revelation, verses 19 and 20 of Romans chapter 1, is definitely available to anyone on the planet as they look upon what God has created. Why don't you look down to verse 19 again of Romans 1. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. I take it what's seen in the verses that follow here in Romans chapter 1 is a basic paradigm for how any people, any society, any culture faces God's wrath in the way we see here when they exchange the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. That's the basic wording of verse 25 if you want to look at that. Now, it's always been an open argument whether America is or ever was a distinctively Christian nation. I'm not going to even wade into that argument this morning. But at least we can say, 
in our founding documents that as a nation we acknowledged the creator. And that's what this passage is talking about. You all know the start of the Declaration of Independence in Congress, July 4th, 1776. That's Independence Day for everyone in this room. I just saw a little video where people were asked, well, when did we get our independence and who is it from? July 4th, 1776 from Great Britain. Okay. The unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. Okay, well, what's that talking about? We're going to see in a moment that by speaking of nature's God, they're talking about the Creator. And that's what Romans 1 is talking about, acknowledging the Creator. So, going on. The laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In our founding documents, again, was America a Christian nation or not a Christian nation? I won't get into that. But I can say, in our founding documents, there's an acknowledgement that there's a creator, and we are created. And that's not enough to save anybody. It's not even distinctly Christian to say that. This Romans 1 revelation is for anyone in the world, whether they've even heard the gospel or not. Everyone has enough revelation to come to this conclusion through uh, the creation itself. But with what we're going to see in Romans chapter 1, the paradigm here is what happens when you exchange the creator for worshiping and serving the creation. And what we're going to see in Romans chapter 1 is that there's an outbreak of God's wrath even now when this exchange happens and that his wrath is seen in turning people over. Look down to verse 21, Romans 1 verse 21. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking. In other words, uh, they became occupied with things that ultimately are worthless, things that ultimately are empty, uh, and their foolish hearts were darkened. In other words, in, in the deepest sense of who someone is, in their heart, they're without understanding. It, it's been darkened. When people as a whole, or individuals in the sense it's certainly bad for anyone, but when people as a whole do not honor God as God or give thanks to him, the thinking is deeply impacted. Their reasonings become worthless and empty. And their heart, who they are inside, becomes without understanding and darkened. Again, I, I, I take it this is not necessarily every individual, but as it's said here in verse 21, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God. When there's this failure to worship and thank God as God by a people, then they become this way in time. Futile in their thinking. Foolish hearts darkened. And this is further characterized in verse 22. We'll see that in a second. Before we look down there, here's what Douglas Moo says brings out. He says this, this verse, verse 22, initiates three parallel descriptions of man's rejection of God and the corresponding punitive response of God, verses 22 through 24, 25 through 27, 28 through 31. The parallelism is clear from the repeated vocabulary. We're going to go over that just here in a second, but it's not like several different steps here from verse 22 and following. It's different parallel statements. The, these things happen uh, when God is being rejected. And when these things are happening, 
This is an example of God's wrath being revealed from heaven right now. In, wh- in wherever in the world these things are happening. Whatever time it's happening. For instance, we're going to see uh, this parallelism in these statements. A basic Greek root word used three times. Look at verse 23. Romans 1 verse 23. And exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. Exchanged. Now, I say a basic root word. This is, it doesn't have a preposition in front of it, but it's the same that you're going to see in another couple of verses. Verse 25. Verse 25 here in Romans 1. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And then verse 26. Same basic root word. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women, exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. So in in each of these passages, there's this exchange that happens between the truth of God, the truth about God, the truth that God's revealed for something else. And then following each one of these exchanges, there's three reactions of God. And in this context, I take it these reactions of God are examples of right now, wherever this is happening, in history, in time. These are examples of God's wrath being revealed from heaven, even in the here and now. Verse 24. So there's the exchange, and then there's God's reaction. Verse 24. Therefore, God gave them up. Verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up. Verse 28. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up. These examples of uh, God giving them up, these are examples of his wrath being revealed from heaven. In Paul's day, he saw this. He saw this all around him. In essence, what we see in this passage is there's an exchange by people And then there's wrath of God. He gave them up. Look down to verse 22. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. So here's where the futility of thinking and the foolish darkened hearts and simply becoming fools. Here's here's where this is ultimately seen. If you're thinking, oh, they're, they're all stupid. Where this is seen is in verse 23. This is the futility of thinking, and this is the darkness of heart, and this is becoming fools. When you do what verse 23 says, and exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Often sociologists will say something like, well, first among humanity there was a a polytheism and there was idolatry and and everyone was like this and they were trying to figure things out and they worshipped rocks and lightning and stars and all these kind of things. First there was that and then gradually men grew into the monotheism that we see in the Bible. What we see here in Romans chapter 1 is it's exactly the opposite. First, there's a knowledge of the creator that's found in his creation. People should have at least acknowledged him. People should have at least sought to worship him as the creator, give thanks to him, but they don't always do so. After that, then comes a change in the thinking. And then comes, after the change in thinking, the futility of mind and the foolishness and the darkness of heart. And and after that, and and God only knows the time frame of these kind of things. Is it 100 years? Is it 50 years? I, I don't know. God knows. But after this change in thinking, then comes exchanging the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and animals and birds and creeping things he talks about here. Again, how long does that take? I don't know. Paul doesn't say. In the scripture, we don't have a timeline of, well, if you turn away from the creator for 10 years, then it leads to this, and then 10 more years, it leads to that. We don't have a timeline. I don't think it's overnight, but when there's this initial failure to honor God as God, 
even as the creator, and give thanks to him. In time, there comes with that a change in thinking, and the change goes downward. And it's a change in thinking to such an extent that there comes this exchange, not just neglect of the creator at this point in time, but an exchange from the creator, who is eternal and exists in great power, to, oh, I'll, I'll start worshiping some man. I'll start having an idol that I make with my own hands that's visible. Uh, I'll start making up things to answer questions about, well, why is there rain? Or why is the world as it is? I'll just come up with my own ideas and make these things. And although we don't see this in Romans chapter 1, we do see elsewhere that even though an idol is, it's nothing, it's, it's stupidness, standing behind it are demons. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 19, What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything, or that an idol is anything? No. I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons, and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. So, yeah, idols, it's, it's a matter of silliness, stupidness, foolishness, futility to come up with these kind of things. But there is a demonic element standing behind the idolatry as well that Paul brings out. Over the last few months and years, there's been an assortment of ways that in our society, there's been expressions of not just neglecting God and not just acknowledging, no longer acknowledging him as the creator or giving thanks to him, but a turning to idols or false gods. For instance, uh, Naomi Wolf, she's a feminist. She's a former advisor to Bill Clinton. She's not a believer in Jesus Christ as of yet. Maybe she's working that way, I don't know. She's an author of some very dubious works. I don't recommend her. I don't recommend her. So I'm not saying that. But even she is noticing that there's a returning to the old pagan gods and idols. This unbelieving feminist is seeing these kind of things like, what is going on? It starts with not acknowledging God as creator, not giving thanks to him as such. That leads to futility in thinking. That leads to the exchange from the glory of the immortal God to mortal man, worshiping that, or whatever uh, animals, creeping things, birds, whatever demonic expressions there might be. This Naomi Wolf, she recites a few examples, and then she's going to ask why, in a sense of why is this happening after each of these examples, and uh, based on Romans 1, the answer I would give is that, well, first there's a failure to acknowledge God as God, to honor him or give thanks to him, and then in time, false gods, false idols are exchanged for the true God. That's an answer to her question why that you're going to see her uh, giving here. But I, I just want to, I don't know if you're aware of all these things, and when she started listing these, I, I guess I've heard of all of them, but when you just see it in one list, it's like, wow, we are, we are, uh, we are there. First, she says, a, a Temple of Baal archway was in fact expensively reconstructed from its original in Syria and moved to appear at a major thoroughfare in London and was now unveiled in Washington, D.C. and in New York. And she asks, why? It's crazy. Who, why would we rebuild a Temple of Baal archway? and move it to our national capital. And you can see this picture of when it was there. I don't think it's there anymore. It might be in New York City at this point. So this is not her saying this. This is me saying this. But where they set up this archway, you could see through the archway. I don't remember if it's the Capitol building or the White House, but they set it up in a very distinctively placed uh, area. Temple of Baal archway. Second, a bizarre opening ceremony in a new train site in Switzerland at which European leaders were present included a horned entity, an ibex, 
the upholding of a symbolic lamb, the appearance of a terrifying angel. And uh, I, I've seen that ceremony. It is disturbing. There are lots of leaders of Europe that were present at this thing. And she asked, why? Why? It's just you know craziness. It's silliness. Why would we do that? There's a not acknowledging of God as the creator or giving thanks to him. Thinking becomes futile. Hearts are darkened. And then the exchange is made. Katy Perry's performance in 2015, I think that was at the Super Bowl. I didn't look this up. I, I've seen the pictures of that. Katy Perry's performance in 2015 in which she performs astride a massive mechanical lion directly echoed the symbology of Ishtar, Asherah, down to her iconic stance. You know, why at a national event like the Super Bowl would you do something like that? I won't repeat it again. The pattern of Romans 1. Sam Smith's unholy, bathed in lurid red light with its satanic imagery, takes the Grammys, and Billboard respectfully gets a quote from the Church of Satan while mocking the pearl clutching of conservatives. This was just at the recent Grammy Awards. Why? A terrifying animated bull figure with glowing red eyes is apparently worshipped by scantily dressed male and female dancers at the Commonwealth Games opening ceremony in Birmingham, England in 2012, 2022. This is just bizarre. Why? Well, we, we know the why, but we're seeing the exchange, the exchange in institutions, the exchange in public ceremonies. You know, it's like, bail? You know, why, why would you be doing something like in any kind of opening ceremony? What, what's the point? <coughs> Romans 1 tells us, the bull was once a symbol of Baal. Satan Khan is coming to Boston in 2023. And that might be right now. I'm not sure the date of that, but uh, that, that's coming. It's getting fairly respectful coverage in the Boston Globe. A highlight of the upcoming conference Abortion as a religious right. Why? And then finally, she notes, a, a statue has been erected to honor the late Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Inexplicably, inexplicably it has horns and tentacles. This is in New York City. It's along this row of statues of famous things. Why, why would you do that of, you know, if you're trying to honor her, make it look like that? And she writes, this feminist unbeliever, uh, I could go on and on. Once you see the occult, satanic, pre-Christian, dark, or diamant, diamonistic themes reestablishing themselves in Western society, you cannot unsee them. I think we're... We're, we're seeing Romans 1 being played on our eyes. It, it's not just a not acknowledging God, not honoring him as God, giving thanks to him as we ought, which, so that's how it starts. That moves to the thinking, futility in their thinking, uh, darkened in their hearts, uh, becoming foolish. That leads to then, which I, I believe this is where we're at, an exchange being made from now, it's not just we're neglecting the Creator, but we're exchanging the Creator for false gods, false images. And when I say we, I don't mean you, because you wouldn't be here if that was you, but we're seeing things in institutions, we're seeing things in society as a whole, cultural things where this, this is happening. So, we're in Romans chapter 1 as part of this series of God's wisdom amid a brave new world to answer the question, what happened? We saw it answered in Genesis. What I guess, I, I'm, I'm, I, I 
almost hesitant to say this because I, I don't like to say this, but I, I think partly what we can see when we ask the question of, well, there's God's perfect creation in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, and we went over things like identity and marriage and family and work. You know, what's changed all that? Why, why isn't it like that anymore? We saw the fall. We spent however many weeks in Genesis chapter 3. But I think the last answer we give to that question, what happened? I think we're experiencing being turned over. I think we're seeing God's wrath being poured out on us as a society because we have exchanged the truth of God for the lie. Look back in your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. Verse 24. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and deceiving in themselves, receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done and following. I, I think we're, we're seeing that, we're experiencing that. I think we've been turned over as a society, as maybe even we'd say Western society. I don't think it's just the U.S. When you wonder, why are things so different? Why are things so crazy right now? Why are states passing laws like they're passing? Uh, I could go on and quote all kinds of, like Minnesota passed some crazy law in Washington. And, you know, why are they doing these kind of things? I, I take it. We're seeing being turned over to our sinfulness. It's, it's God's wrath. The great exchange has happened, and I think we're experiencing the wrath side of it. Tonight, instead of Psalm 23, I want to get back into Romans chapter 1, because uh, I've talked too long about all this other stuff here. So we're back there tonight. I'd just like to note a few things before closing this morning. First, this was Paul's world. As he wrote this, this was his world. This is what he saw. This is what he lived in. And through the power of the gospel, over whatever you say, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 years, whatever it was, the light of the gospel, the power of God, it, it, it didn't end this way. Things changed. So when we say, when I say, and, and I, I know there's others who'd say this as well, I, I think we're under God's wrath in the sense of we're being turned over to these kind of sins. That doesn't mean it has to stay that way. It doesn't mean that's the end of things. Because this was the world Paul lived in. And it didn't stay that way. In the minor prophets, part of their job was they would be telling Israel or Judah, God is judging you. These things that you're seeing around you, th this is God's judgment. This is God's wrath. You need to turn from that. You need to repent of that. And, and, and you can get right with God again. That's the minor prophets. I suppose the major prophets too, we could say that. We don't have minor prophets. We don't have major prophets right now. We do have Romans 1. And, and if we're seeing the things that are described in Romans chapter 1, number 1, that the exchange is being made to turn from the creator to creation to worship and serve that, and if we're seeing things that look like, wow, uh, I, I see these things that talks about God turning them over. If, if we're seeing these things in our society, not, not just among individuals, but government and institutions and schools and you know everything starts going this way. 
I can say in one sense, I, I hesitate to say it, but in another sense, I, I sincerely believe it. I, I think we're witnessing, we are being turned over to the wrath of God in these particular ways. That's how we prophesy today. We have God's word and we compare it with the situation that we're in and, and here we are. I think that's it. If God is doing this, if we're being turned over to these things, and we'll look what these things are further tonight in Romans chapter 1 instead of Psalm 23, then politics is not going to change it. I hate to say it. Politics is not going to make God say, uh, okay, because you have a, a, a good president, you're no longer under the wrath of God here in this area. Politics won't change the wrath of God. God takes away the wrath of God. So what do you do? Number one, you still vote. So we have a Lincoln election coming up here Tuesday. You still vote, and you still vote for those people who, uh, as you look at their policies, you look at the things they've done, they most reflect God's moral will as revealed in Scripture. You still vote. You still do that. But if the things that we're seeing are not just political. I mean, it is crazy what's happening. And we're seeing this debased mind and foolishness and futility of thinking and all these. God needs to rescue us from that turning over. And at least some things that we see in the Old Testament, in the book of Judges, even over God's people, you'd see them go through these cycles They'd be right with God and they'd be serving him and following him and then they'd start following Baal and then a little while after that then they'd be turned over to some foreign nation and they'd come in and conquer, the, conquer them. And what did the Israelites almost always do? You can yell it out if you know it. They called out to God. They called out to God. And then he came and gave them a judge and kind of rescued them out of that. And they were good for a while again, and then they go bad again, and then call out to God. So if anything, I'd say, if we are under God's wrath, in the sense of Romans chapter 1, and I believe we are, the biggest thing, the, the most important thing we can do is call out to God. The National Day of Prayer is coming up this Thursday. And you might think, ah, National Day of Prayer, it happens every year. We, we need to call out to God. And there are services at the Capitol to call out to God on Thursday, the legislature. We're going to have a National Day of Prayer service here at the church Thursday evening at 7 o'clock. Thursday evening at 7 o'clock. If you're wondering, oh, I don't think I heard about that. I'm just announcing it right now. I mean, I've talked to our elders about it, but outside of that, I hinted at it last Sunday evening. But Thursday evening at 7 o'clock, boy, we need, we need God to do something here because the politics, again, do vote, and that's super important, and I'm going to vote. You better vote. In Lincoln election, your votes really, really, really matter. But that's not going to ultimately change this. God does. We need to call out to him in prayer. In Romans chapter 1, the whole point of Romans 1.18 and following isn't to help us here in 21st century America. The whole point is to highlight why the gospel is so great. Romans 1.16 and 17. Because Romans 1.18 says, Well, the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness. As Christians, in Paul's day and in our own day, we have the hope of the world you don't have to face God's wrath as an individual. You don't have to wait for that final day of judgment. You can be saved from that. Well, it does say it's against all ungodliness, and I'm ungodly, so what can I do? Well, the good news is that God sent his son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, when he was in this world, he always lived perfectly. He always did the right thing. He, he never sinned. He never did anything wrong. That, that's just who he is. But at the end of his life, he is put to death on the cross. 
while he was suffering on the cross. The good news is he was bearing our sins and our unrighteousness and all the things that we should be judged for as individuals. He bore, he experienced, he was punished for, I guess we could say. So we don't have to face that. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead. And it's, that's all by grace. And you can be saved from the wrath to come because Christ's perfect righteousness, once you truly trust in Jesus Christ, if you have faith in him, if you rely on Jesus Christ to save you, you are regarded as righteous. His righteousness is, here's a big fancy word, imputed to you. You are reckoned righteous. He counts you as righteous before himself, this holy God. And that's why we say it's the hope of the world. Because uh, whether we're in 1940s America or 2023 America, you need to get saved. And we need the righteousness of God. So as Christians, boy, we need to be gospel-sharing people. Gospel proclaiming people. Uh, that's, that's the hope in Rome in AD, whatever year it was, 62 when Paul wrote this. That's the, that's the hope of the world. It's the hope of America in 2023, the gospel. We, we need that. And we need to be zealous in that. And we need to be taking opportunities in that. And speaking the truth in love whenever we have opportunity. So, come back tonight. We'll look more at Romans 1 and the details of the turning over and that kind of thing that we'll see. But uh, if you can't be back tonight, I, I would love to see everyone who's here right now back here Thursday evening at 7, just calling upon God. God, uh, save us, help us, you know, move. We confess our sins. So we'll have different people praying and confessing and leading in prayer. and uh, The Old Testament pattern is calling out to God is what saves you from a societal wrath to come. Think of, think of Nineveh when Jonah preached there. Yeah, 40 days and the wrath of God is going to come. Oh man, it's going to happen. And they're all, they're all ex uh, repenting and wearing sackcloth and ashes and even down to the animals. I'm trying to still figure out how, that, I, I, how they did that. But uh, they got it, and they called upon God. Okay, we see what's happening. We don't want this. Save us. Protect us. Uh, so don't, don't think prayer is just a minor thing when a, when a people does that. And last but not least, I'll just say, uh, I loved in 2016 when Franklin Graham went to every state capital in the United States to pray for, uh, actually it was more of a, a call to confess and repent before God. But I, I think that was a very big deal in our nation's history. And who's to say, as we're calling out to God right now, that the same things won't happen once again. So uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your revelation. We thank you that as individuals, whatever might be happening society-wise, we are not stuck in... Uh, being guilty before you and facing your wrath. That because of your love for us, because of your grace, because of what Jesus has done for us, we can be forgiven of all of our sins. And we can be reckoned righteous because of Christ's righteousness regarded as ours. And all that happens not because we work really hard or we go to a good church, but all that happens because we have relied on, had faith in Jesus Christ as he's revealed in the gospel. So we thank you for that. We ask if there be anyone here this morning who's never yet received Jesus Christ and as, as they're thinking about God's wrath and the terrifying nature of that and there will be a day where people will stand before him and face his eternal wrath. And if they're, they're wondering that, just that they should read through this passage and see even now there's expressions of your wrath and, and they can turn from it. They, they don't have to face it. They can receive the free gift that Jesus Christ came to bring. So touch their hearts 
Enable them to repent and believe in your Son, Jesus Christ. And help all of us as your people in this time, such a time as this, to be faithful and bright lights and those who are calling out to you to help us and heal our land. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.